Welcome to the Sailor Noob Podcast, where a super fan and a noob talk about the original Sailor Moon episode by episode. I'm your host, Mikan Hana, joined by my co-host. I'm your co-host, Caliban, the noob, because it's me. <laughs> it, it is, and we're a couple of magical people ready to moon crystal power make up this episode. Sailor Noob is brought to you by Ringu, Ringu, Ringu. You have seven days. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I couldn't resist. It's, uh, I don't hold a grudge against you. <laughs> uh, I found out just through the process of working on this episode that the, there is a 2016 movie that is a crossover between Ringu and Juan. It's Sadako versus Kayako. It's their Freddy versus Jason. Oh, my God. It's like That's two insane. Ku Korean franchises go head to head. Oh, wait, no. Ringu was just Japanese or was it Korean first? It was Japanese. It was based on uh, novels. That's Oh, that's right. Yes. All right. So yes. it's an international smackdown. Well, and, and the novels, I don't know if you know this, but are actually based on one of the most well-known ghost stories in, in Japan, at least... It's That's why it's partially likes, they light the lanterns, based on. And then they're like, oh, no, I can't. I can't light that last lantern. That's no, too scary. no, no. That's that's like when they're they're doing, <laughs> the what, did, what do we call it? That was like the ghost stories and they were going from room to room to room. Right, right. Yeah. No, this is about, uh, this ghost story is 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 about uh, this woman named o- Okiku. And she was a beautiful young woman who worked as a dishwashing servant <laughs> at the Himeji <laughs> Castle. And he made you castle was a real place. Is this, this is like Princess? No, not Princess Mona. This is like uh, Spirited Away. Me. She was a no. dishwasher, wasn't she? N- well, she did a she lot. She was kind of a cat's paw. She did she, a lot. Of stuff. She did a lot of stuff. Um, but but so he made you castles on the main island of Honshu, and it's one of the largest. Ca- it's the largest castle in Japan. Very popular tourist attraction. Anyways, a samurai named uh. Al- Aoyama uh, was uh, one of their, her master's retainers and became very taken with Okiku and tried many times to win her affection, but Okiku um, was not interested and rebuffed she him. Got dishes to wash. That's right. Um, and, and there's lots of different versions of the story I should I should mention as well. And Aoyama grew sick of waiting for Okiku to change her mind. Uh oh. So he decided that he would do what he could to force her to be with him. Uh huh. Which always turns out great. Yeah. Uh, me too. <laughs> so in the castle, there is a set of ten expensive, sometimes referred to as gold dishes. Um, and Aoyama hid one and then told Ukiku that one of the master's dishes was missing and asked her where it was. Don't mess with the girl at her job. Yeah, right? Nobody wants that. And Ukiku grew frightened at the punish because the punishment for losing one of her master's dishes was death. It was your ass. Yeah. So she counted the dishes over and over again, each time only reaching nine. And she was <laughs> really upset. So Aoyama told Okiku that he would turn a blind eye to the missing plate and let their master know that it was not Okiku who lost it if she would agree to be his lover. Okiku refuses him again. So in one version of the story, Okiku throws herself down the well that's outside of the castle, not seeing any alternative to ending her situation. In another version, Aoyama tortures Okiku and eventually throws her down the well. In either case, she dies down a well. (laughs) Um, awful. Well, yeah, we got to get the ring set up. Right. So (laughs) shortly after her death, Okiku's ghost is seen around the castle. Each night she would emerge from the well, enter the castle and search for the missing dish. Uh, She would be heard counting the plates nightly. And when she got to nine, she would scream this horrific blood curdling scream. Um, and she haunted Aoyama in this way, nightly preventing him from sleeping and eventually drove him insane. Does he um, jump down a well? That's how this has to end. Well, that would be great, uh, but no. no. Um, he so, gets mental health treatment and he's fine. I, I don't know what happens to him, <laughs> yeah. actually. Well. So supposedly those who heard part of Okiku count, or her counting uh, grew very ill, and those who heard her count all the way to nine died shortly thereafter. So <laughs> that's, 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 that's just like it. Yeah, exactly. There's just no TV to crawl out right, of. Right, exactly. And the Lord of the Castle decided that something had to be done to rid the castle of this vengeful ghost. So he called a priest 
I need a young priest and an old priest. <laughs> yeah. um, and he, he was he was, a priest was brought in to assist putting Okiko's spirit uh, to rest. And the priest waited all night by the well for Okiko to make an appearance. And while he waited, he chanted uh, sutras. And when Okiko's ghost appeared, she began counting as soon as she said nine. And before she could scream, the, the priest yelled, ten! <laughs> <laughs> and her, her ghost seemed relieved that someone at long last had found the missing dish. And that was the last night that she haunted the castle. <laughs> uh, Your mother eats Pocky in hell. I, I know, right? Uh, and, but the, the, the weird thing is, so I'm, I'm not 100% sure if... Um, these were actual living figures at some point or not. But at Himeji Castle in real life, there is a well that is outside of the castle walls that is referred to as Okiku's Well. Huh. And it now, <laughs> yeah, it now has wrought iron bars covering it and a stone fence around it. Yeah, that's probably for the best. So take that from what you will. People but, should leave, bring dishes, leave dishes there. Ooh, yeah, gold dishes. Nobody ever went and looked for the, this dish? It's got to be somewhere. Apparently not. <laughs> um, but drawings of Akiku looked very similar to that of uh, Sadako was the name of uh, the ghost in Ringu, and Samara was the gross, uh, the name of the ghost in the, the English film, The right, Ring, right. the American film. Um, and, and looked very similar in appearance, wearing a white dress and long black hair. And this apparently is how the spirit of an, an individual in Japan who died under unnatural circumstances um, and did not receive proper burial rites is often depicted. Typically, they would have been buried in a white burial kimono. Uh -huh. And uh, these spirits, spirits are known as uh, yurei, uh, which translates to faint spirit. Uh, so it's a kind of yokai. Sure. Um, so I just thought that was kind of interesting. So, Okiku versus Jason. Right, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that's okay. All right. So it's what? It's like 19... It's the early 90s, mm -hmm. right? And the book Ring comes out. Mm -hmm. That's got to be in the public consciousness. Yeah. I mean, we're kind of like... We're kind of doing the show upside down this week. We are a, a little, little bit. history at the beginning. Well, yeah, I know. But um, later on, you know, we can talk about whether uh, this has any connection to uh, to the Ring. The yeah. Right now. Exactly. Right. Here we go. Uh, so today we are talking about episode number 77, Omoe wa onaji, usagi to mamoru no ai futabi in Japanese. Shared feelings, usagi and mamoru in love once again. The English translation and the English title, Promises Fulfilled. Promises Fulfilled. Is a there a promises? A clunky title. Yeah, it's pretty straightforward. Yeah. You know, there's no pun. No. <laughs> There's no nothing you can really do with it. Oh, lovers once again. I don't know. Promise is there was a promise is broken and then a promise is fulfilled. Like a yeah. taming of the shrew. I, I understand what you're the, saying. The tamer tamed. Right, right. I can't remember if there was a promise is broken so. episode or not. I don't think so. Yeah. Anyways. I wouldn't know. Because yeah. I've been watching a lot of Pretty Guardian Sailor Moon. Yeah. The 2003 live action Sailor Moon series <laughs> from probably, we'll look into it, NHK TV. So, you know, it's whatever their TV is. Yeah. I think Toei is involved. Is. Yeah, of yeah. course they are. Yeah. yeah. Of course they and are. And we have been watching it because we're covering it now. We are. On our Patreon. Mm -hmm. If you go to patreon.com forward slash Sailor Noob, all one word, mm -hmm. you'll find our outtakes from the show, you'll find some of our extra content material, and you'll find our recaps of Pretty Guardian Sailor Moon That's entitled right. Pretty Guardian Sailor Noobs. Plural. Because we're not ever, we don't know nothing about we're, it. We're both noobs yeah. in this one. Yeah. And we're doing it. We're talking about the show. We're talking about, it, it's, it's a lot like this show. It's just a little more compact. And it moves a little quicker, mm -hmm. uh, which I don't know, maybe this show should. But uh, and we talk about, uh, you know, kind of the real life things. One of the reasons that I'm, I, I'm excited about it is because this obviously is a um, cartoon look at the 90s. Uh, teen culture of Japan. Yeah, And right. basically just making a show for kids, you have to kind of elide over some things and just kind of other... Do kids really like uh, ice cream and, uh, and and friendship bracelets this much? Everybody likes ice cream. Well, that's okay. true. All right. Thank you very much. But what about like the drinking the juice? Remember chugging the juice? And we're like, is that a thing? Chugging the like, juice? I don't know if chugging the juice is a oh, thing. Oh, she just... had the, the love potion? Yeah. Is that what you're talking about? But this yeah, is... The reason I, I like this is because you can't fake a lot of this. Sure, there's goofy stuff, but right. a lot of this is like actual Japanese teenagers in the mid 2000s. Right. We already hit a really 
a, just a beautiful b-ball scene where the girls <laughs> go uh, do the three girl weave uh, and a bunch of uh, uh, toughs, <laughs> some street toughs. Yeah. And yeah. getting to see like, you know, real deal, real life Japanese life uh, for kids at yeah. that time is just really cool. It is really neat. That's one of the things that we do and we talk about and we, um, little, little trick. You think we'd start with number one, but what comes before one? Zero. Blame blame the Arabs. Blame <laughs> Arab scientists oh who invented zero for this. So yeah, we actually start with number zero. So if you want to join us on that journey, check us out at patreon.com forward slash sailor noob. Become a member of the show yes. and join us on this newbie journey. You will believe that a stuffed cat can talk. Without further ado, <laughs> Cal, would you like to give us a synopsis of this episode of Sailor Moon? There's going to be a lot of feels. There's yeah. some feels happening. Yeah. And uh, we're not talking about the hair care product for men. Uh, we're open for sponsorships. Uh, we open on a clock because it's about time. Time's up. Right, Okiku? Yeah. It's 9.30 and Usagi is late for class. You know, if she gets expelled, she'll never get into a good superhero college. <laughs> she has to get a superhero GED. Yeah, no kidding. Does she need college if she's going to be a superhero? Let's talk about this. What does she want to do with herself? We don't really know. I mean, honestly, you know, she's she's 14. She can't be 14 still. That's insane. She's but 14. Anyway, she's 14 somehow. They battle two monsters a day for 75 weeks. Mm -hmm. uh, and what does she want to do? We don't really know. That's fair. Yeah. Um, I think you can. She doesn't even have a dream. They're, like like Monaco, mm -hmm. not really in this, but, you know, Monaco. At least in the manga, she wants, wants to be to an be a idol. Star. Yeah. And uh, I think I think Makoto is just surviving at this point. <laughs> she's just she's a survivor. Well, I mean, I don't. And then, the, a, there is actually a section within the manga that's reflected oh, in the manga, Crystal. Manga, the manga, the manga. That like talks well, when we about cover Crystal. We'll talk about it. It then. talks about the Senshi's like dreams, yeah. but it doesn't talk about. Usagi's well, we know she dreams. wants to get married. Oh, that's her plan. She just get married. And... Well, that's part of Makoto's plan. No, no, Usagi. Oh, Usagi. Marries... Okay. Mamoru, who's uh, independently wealthy. Yeah, and, right. So, no problem. Right. <laughs> it's a good thing that it was a Lamborghini his parents died in. Okay. Wow. Uh, she's running at top speed, and we get an Usagi POV shot in perspective as mm -hmm. she's racing down this hallway. And I kind of figure she's not going to make it into the classroom, because as we all know, no more Haruna-sensei. Yeah, right. R.I.P. Yeah. Recess in peace. Oh, and my goodness. I'm right. Just as she reaches her classroom, she runs into something unexpected. Umino! Yeah. No one could have guessed that she'd run into him. Mostly because we haven't seen him in a few months. We haven't. She slams into Umino at top speed, sending them both sprawling. His glasses have fallen off and he's looking around for them on the floor like Velma. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Naru is also there. She's like, Jeez, are you okay? Usagi notices that the homeroom class isn't there and Umino says that Miss Haruna is not here today. Mm -hmm. Or ever. Yeah. So, that sure, okay. That's how we're going to do it. What? Bri Brian's on his way. Brian's on his way. Family. Yeah, I know. So they've got study hall for first period. A stroke uh -huh. of luck for Usagi. Although she thinks to herself, oh, I could have had another bowl of rice. I know. It's important to be on time. <laughs> Naru says, uh, give it back to me, Amino. It's not finished. And she's talking about a promise ring, which is what she calls a friendship bracelet for some strange reason. Yeah. I assume we're going to talk about this later. Yeah, we will. So we'll let it slide for now. Usagi hears Puramis Ringu and gets it confused with Puramisringu. Yeah. Which, you know, is pro wrestling. So right. we see a quick fantasy of Naru and Umino facing off in the squared circle. And yes. Naru gives Umino a German suplex. <laughs> I know. I know. It's in reaction great. to this vision, Usagi says, ecchi, or kinky. Yeah, ecchi means kinky. And Umino and Naru are like, no, this is not good. Yeah, <laughs> right. Not, no, not that. <laughs> Get that image on your head. Naru shows Usagi some more promise rings. And yeah, they're friendship bracelets. She says, you weave them while you make your wish and you wear them on your wrist or your ankle. When they fall off, your wish comes true. Mm -hmm. So hot right now. Uh-huh. Promise rings. Yeah. Not friendship bracelets. We'll, we'll, we will get to it. And we yeah. see that indeed many of the class are making or wearing them. Usagi thinks, I got to get in, get in on this. Mm -hmm. And Umino shows her a flyer for a new store that sells promise rings and promise ring paraphernalia in the Juban area. Yep. This poster is what I would call... Kind of like Neo Art Nouveau. Okay. Which is, of course, a tautology. Uh, right. Neo is new in Greek. Yeah. Nouveau is new in French. Right, right, right. And the mucha like woman on the poster, you guessed it, has green hair. Uh, yeah, good point. 
Hey, sometimes you got to play the hits. We got yeah. a new fad the students are into and a shop that supplies them staffed by an evil person. Yeah, it's right. It's classic. Yeah. This is like the free bird of Sailor Moon. <laughs> Here's another Greek word for you. Dystopia means bad place. Yeah, right. <laughs> Tokyo, where every business is just a mall waiting to devour I know. You. Umino says they sell string, beads. Bees? Beads. Oh, which the word for beads in Japanese is beads, I guess. Beadzu, yeah. Okay, sure. Yeah, right. And they offer free classes. Mm-hmm. Naru says, if you give one to your boyfriend, you'll be together forever. So I guess this Umino Naru thing is still going. Uh, apparently, yes. Namino is their couple name. Aww. Usagi has a flashback <laughs> to Mamoru telling her to get lost. She becomes a little melancholy. Yeah. I thought she'd immediately try to make a bracelet for Mamoru, but she's got to think this over. Uh-huh. And she does. As she walks home and she runs into Ami and Makoto. Mm-hmm. They say, hey, why do you look so down? You can talk to us. But she says, eh, it's okay. Don't worry about it. Uh-huh. Hey, did you hear about the new Promise Ring store? And they're like, you mean the Friendship Bracelet store? <laughs> uh, and as she's saying this, they Mamoru walks by. They run into Mamoru. Yeah. And she thinks, my wish came true. Yeah. Screw these rings. It's Momo. And she promptly trips and falls on her face. I know. Mamoru sees this and we see the pain in his eyes that he wants to help her. Yeah. But he just keeps walking. Yeah, I know. Usagi in near tears says, I've been trying to figure out, why don't you like me anymore? Tell me why. Mamoru says, it's just me being selfish. Mm -hmm. Please forgive me. Yeah. And he walks away, leaving Usagi crying on the sidewalk. One note. Ami and Mako are right there. I know. Come on, friends. Get in his face or something. He's dissing your girl. I know. Punch his head off, Makoto. (laughs) We cut to another time and place. It looks like deep space, but there are floating spheres in the void. Hmm. So you know what I'm going to call it? What? Space balls. Oh, okay. I should have guessed that. What's the matter, Colonel Sanders? (laughs) Chicken? Whoa. Floating in the space balls void is a platform with columns and kind of like half a fountain with water pouring into a pool. It's kind of like silver millennium chic. It seems very familiar, like the design. Yeah. uh, Aesthetic. There's also part of a tree. Let's not do that again. No no more space trees. (laughs) It's like a cherry blossom tree. And indeed, some of the pink petals are kind of breezing about the place. And standing at a small table yeah. is Esmeralda, mm-hmm. laughing. Mm, as she does. Enter laughing. Yeah, right, exactly. <laughs> she says, our great Prince Demando poured bright red wine over this beautiful crystal Tokyo. And as she says this, she holds aloft a glass of wine. Of course. And I'm going to fill this crowded Tokyo with dark power. She needs some henchmen. She's all alone in here talking to herself. Yeah, right. <laughs> Just call forth your droid already. She you know? does. Listen to this. Check this out. Yeah, right. I've been working on this for a while. She does her earring thing again and says the new crystal point is here. And we see a high-rise building in 20th century Tokyo. At the top of the building, under a purple sky, Esmeralda appears out of a dark portal. She whips her crystal hinge at the top of the building and summons her droid, Udering. Yeah. And, oh, here we go again. (laughs) We will talk about the droid later. Yes. Esme tells her droid, Tokyo is crowded and suffocating. Collect that energy as quickly as possible. And the droid says, you got it. Ring. Ring? Yeah. Uh, she's just re- is she repeating. <laughs> no, I think so. So she can talk, right? She but can she's, say ring. But well, that. she can say other words, but she's she's repeating part of her name as they do. Yeah. It's yeah. old school. It's old school. This is classic. Yeah. This is, this is uh, uh, give me three steps, mister. They don't all have to be Skinner songs. No, right. <laughs> uh, and she disappears and Esme thinks, oh, Prince Demando, I'll be with you soon. And bury my face in your arms. I know. And anyone looking up just saw a horny floating lady <laughs> in a green dress. Or is it black? It's green. Come At the on. foot of the building are Usagi, Ami, and Mako. Yes. They say, oh, this building is called Misanga's Mansion. We will talk about okay. it. Okay. Yep. And the Promise Ring store is here. And this is sure to work. Mm-hmm. Usagi's not so sure. Yep. Mako says, you know the secret to casting a spell? Let's see where this is going. Mm. She says, what's important is that you believe in it and the power of your belief will bring you happiness. Yeah. Okay. Right. She goes on. I mean, I read that in a book. It's called The Secret. Uh-huh. No. Uh, <laughs> oh, my God. But don't you think that the power of belief can cheer you up? Uh-huh. And Usagi's like, yeah, let's do it. <laughs> Inside, Ami gives Usagi a box with string and a manual for making the ring and says, here's all you need to make your ring. Get your boyfriend back. Right. Not you too, Ami. Come on. I like 
that they're supportive, though. The girls head to the classroom, and Ami and Mako say, good luck. And then they leave to continue smoking whatever crack they must be on. I, I don't I mean, know. Come on. I can see Monaco being into this because she's a romantic. Or maybe Ray because she's secretly girly. And she has literal Buddhist magic. <laughs> so maybe she would think like karmically there's something to this. Like, oh, sure. Or even like positive eyes. But Abi and Mako, I don't know. You, you just My think opinion. they, they picked the, the wrong two sailors? To no, it's company. great that they, came, they, you know, they pulled the strings this week, so to speak, to uh-huh. be in this episode. It's great. Right, right. But I just think if it had been the other two. It would have made more it sense. It might have fit a little more. Mm, okay. The class is full of girls making bracelets. Sorry, rings. And Uminu and Naru are there because they can't get enough. I know. <laughs> The teacher says, first time, why don't you sit with your friends? <laughs> and Naru's like, I'm glad you're here. You seem down today. Yeah, he didn't say anything then. I, I know. <laughs> Come on, Naru. We get what I'm assuming is actually a fairly solid lesson on how to make these bracelets. Yes. <laughs> Which if you were a 10-year-old girl with a VCR in 1994, you hit the jackpot. Yeah, right. This is going to blow you away. Yeah. But Usagi is not great at making these things. No. The teacher suggests trying six strings instead of 10. But this doesn't go well either. No. A bell rings because <laughs> this is school. I, I guess, I guess. This and the is class is over. Click the, your school. The teacher says, "Okay, everybody, read your manuals and practice. Understand?" And Isagi's like, nah, "I have to read. Lame." But the teacher's like, "Understand?" I know. And Isagi's like, "Okay, I got it. I got it." Once the girls leave, the teacher reveals herself to be Udering. Yeah, and she says, "Ole, ole, ole." I know. <sighs> Yeah. It's too bad she's evil, because she was really patient with Usagi. <laughs> she was. Maybe she's programmed to be a good teacher. <laughs> she's at the droid factory, and they're like, I mean, it's deep cover. She has to be. She's not encouraging. She's got a whole, like, Rudy speech. And she turns around and cuts oh somebody's God. head off. Whoa. <laughs> well, Dark. We'll kill her anyway. Uh, she calls Esmeralda and says, everyone wearing a promise ring will have their energy drained tonight, and the dark power will increase greatly. Ringu, ringu. Yeah. And Esme says, excellent. That night at the Sakino household, Chibiusa pokes her head in to see if Usagi has finished her bracelet, but Usagi has conked out face down at her table, yeah. asleep. Chibi says, ah, I want her to make me one. <laughs> Balloon is there and she says, she's tired from trying something new. Same. <laughs> Let her sleep a while. As she sleeps, Usagi says, Mamo, why? And we pan up to her framed picture of Mamo and herself. Mm-hmm. And we hear the bridal chorus. Yeah. We see a vision of Mamoru and Usagi together in white, heading into the church, out of it. And they're married now? She says, we're married now. But yeah, right. But then the bridal march should be playing? Yeah, I, it's maybe, confusing. Maybe they couldn't get the, the rights. <laughs> but anyway, uh, they are married now. And they lean in to kiss. And the ground explodes. Yeah. And a voice says, Mamoru Chiba, you must not get close to Usagi Sakino. And Mamoru's like, ah! We've seen all this. And, yeah. But Usagi <laughs> hasn't. And she shoots up awake. And she thinks, why did I ever dream like that? And as she holds her framed picture, the glass cracks. Just like Mamo's dead. I, what is happening? I know. Is it like, oh, no, that's that's the signature. That's the watch watches. Oh, that melts them every time. <laughs> now they're really scared. <laughs> right? Fun. It's a little overplotted. It, it would be for, for a show for kids. But like, if that was like, ooh, it was a great piece of work. Creepy but wise man. You shouldn't have signed it. Right. Like, it was like, the fact that both pictures could crack. Come on. That's, that's manufactured. That's too much. <laughs> Unlike the brooding Byronic Mamoru who stayed away from Usagi when he got his message, she immediately goes to his place. Yep, yep. <laughs> so starts banging on the door. Yep. Like, Mama Chan. <laughs> he opens the door like, what time do you think it is? But she says, I'm sorry. There's something I have to tell you. And he says, yeah, beat it. Scram, get out of here. <laughs> but she persists saying, did you also have that weird dream? And he's like, weird dream? Nani? <laughs> Outside the building, a cat and a six-year-old child are on the sidewalk in the middle of the night. I, I don't understand why. <laughs> you can't just they bring them be... everywhere with you. I know. <laughs> Luna says, why is she visiting him now? And Chibi thinks, when is she going to finish this bracelet? I know. Sorry, ring. <laughs> Inside, Mamoru and Usagi are comparing notes on their dreams. And Usagi says, you know, it, it could just be a dream. But Mamoru says, but you could die. And Usagi says, wait, so you were mean to me because of the dream? And he says, I didn't want to believe it, but I had the dream every night. It's a dream yeah. of the future, which is a crazy thing to say, but only slightly less crazy than what Usagi says. If it's with you, I don't mind dying. I know. <laughs> Great. <laughs> we got I, Romeo and Juliet, but in more ridiculous clothes. <laughs> JK, so romantic. Uh, Mamoru, with great effort, says, 
We're just not meant to be together. And he pushes her out and he slams the door. Nusagi bangs on the door from the outside, saying, Even if I die and the earth is destroyed, I just want to be with you, Mamo-chan. I know. She falls to her knees outside his door, crying. Outside on the stoop of the building, Luna and Chidi are like, what's taking her so long? <laughs> what is she? I know, I know. Usagi finally appears in the lobby of the building, but as she does, Chibi's promise ring starts to spark and glow, and it sticks itself to her hand. She's yeah. like, ah! Chibi starts crying out, but she does not explode with a sky laser, so what are you going to do? <laughs> yeah, good point. Luna jumps out just every day. There's just lasers blasting through roofs everywhere in the school, the house. Right, right. The public pool. <laughs> Luna jumps up and rips the bracelet off of uh, Chibi's hand and throws it to the ground where it crackles harmlessly. Yeah. Which, well, I'll save it for later. Uh, Chibi's okay, but Usagi realizes that the bracelets are hurting people, and she runs off to do something, leaving Chibi with a talking cat. <laughs> yeah, I know. Across Tokyo, presumably, but definitely at Juban Jr., people are writhing and clutching at their promise rings. All of Usagi's classmates are at school for some reason, because it's, it's like the middle of the night. I think it's cram school. Oh, well, they're cram- but they're cramming their bracelets or something? I, 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 they're just wearing them, and Ami, doesn't, 20. Ami doesn't have one. Well, so. she doesn't have a bracelet. Yeah. Because reasons. <laughs> If she believes in it so much. Well, because she, if she had one, she couldn't call everybody. Yeah, that, those are the reasons. Yeah, if yeah. she does, she calls the other sailors on her communicator watch. Ray is uh, burning something. Uh, Typical. Nina, Mina's just getting out of the shower. Mm-hmm. And Mako's like, it's that new promise ring story, isn't it? <laughs> I know. <laughs> it's like she watches this show. <laughs> they should just burn down every new business that tries to start in town. <laughs> Atop Masanga's mansion, the Dark Henge grows taller and taller. Usagi, Luna, and Chibi arrive, and Usagi transforms into Sailor Moon. Uderring is channeling and gathering the dark power, but Sailor Moon arrives and says, With each knot they make, girls put on these knots to make their wishes come true, but you imbued them with an evil power. Unforgivable! Yes. In the name of the moon, I'll punish you! <laughs> this does not make Uderring happy. She attacks with one ring attack! Yeah. A, and she says, a diagonal pattern makes your wishes come true. Ring! Yeah, I know. <laughs> and she throws a glowing ring into the ground in front of Usagi. She also says, "This." she says, the secret to magic is to not give up after the first try. Well, who, who, what is this book and who? where can I get it? They're I all know. reading it. <laughs> but she's still kind of teaching though, isn't she? She is. Maybe her teaching program is coming through. Yeah, Head right. Can. Right. Yeah. Oh, very good. Two ring for someone with no boyfriend. The heart pattern is perfect. Uh huh. She's using. She's weaving a ring over Usagi. I know. Who barely dodges these two rings? Ring, 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 ring again. She says, but before she can attack, a red rose shatters her ring. She cries out, "Who's there?" Ring. <laughs> it's Tuxedo Mask. He's already on top of a skyscraper, but he's standing on the elevator house on the building's roof. Uh Still higher. (laughs) (laughs) He says, a promise ring is a ring of hope. I just realized that he like mansplains everything. He does. Love is when you care for other people. Uh, Yeah. yeah. Okay. We got it. Mask (laughs) splainer. Abusing the trust of beautiful girls. You have an ugly heart droid. The droid laughs. I'm laughing. And mocks trust and throws three ring thunder which sends Tuxedo Mask for a loop. Uterring says, For someone seeking to make up with a friend, ethnic patterns are best. Lot to break down. Oh, God. Lot to break down. I know. But I think it's weird that does she has, like, can she read minds? All of these are, like, weirdly um, uh, appropriate correspond. for the people that she's attacking. Yes. It's weird. It is weird. Well, before Tuxedo Mask can be finished off by the rings, a shine aqua illusion blasts them and freezes them, too, because why not? Why not? Water and, and ice. Yes. Sailor Mercury has arrived. The droid says, okay, four-wheel drive. For those who want to beat a rival in love, a V pattern will be the perfect thing. Ring. <laughs> Who's got a rival in love? I, 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 I don't know. This we is what have... I mean. So does Ami have a crush? Not that we know of. War? Not that we know of. Weird. I don't think so. You got, you got me, you got me straight tripping, Uda Ring. I don't. Ring. I, I, I think she's I'm trying wrong. to figure out what's going on. <laughs> <laughs> There's no rivals, not yet. No. Mercury and Moon are on the run from the ring attack, but a burning mandala destroys the rings. Okay, last resort. Five ring pick. What? I have no idea. <laughs> what ring? Ring pick? Ring pick? Ring toss? I I don't. Pick I don't... pick pick a ring. Pick a ring. I think she's got it. Uh-huh. <laughs> a sparkling <laughs> nobody's gonna. A sparkling wide pressure and a love me chain destroy this attack. We don't yes. even get a good look at it. It just like immediately they destroy it. Yeah. So the other sailors have arrived. Uterring says, "Shoot, 
ring. <laughs> now Sailor Moon and MPH and Ootering is no more. Yep. R.I.P. <laughs> Ootering. Ring in peace. Ring oo. <laughs> Ring out! All of the bracelet wearers are free, and the dark hinge once again is destroyed. But Esmerad appears in the sky above the building, mm-hmm. laughing. Yeah. Enter flying. Yeah. And laughing. She says, you impotent soldiers, listen up. The dark gate will soon open in Tokyo, and when it does, the evil oh. Black Crystal's power will flood this place. Yes. Inundate. I said that before. Inundate. <laughs> then the silver crystal will turn evil. Ooh, new, new, new lore. And black, and the world will be destroyed by dark power. <laughs> she disappears. Yeah. But her laughter rings <laughs> for a, a long time after. Tuxedo yeah. Mask turns to Sailor Moon and says, Protecting Tokyo and Crystal Tokyo is our duty. Mask, mask, please. <laughs> Whatever hardships stand in our way, we must continue. Let us continue to fight together. Sarabara. Yes. This whole time, Usagi is like, Is this, is this like a, a double meaning? Is like fight together, like go out again. Uh, I this don't is understand. the problem of having secret identities, yeah. which aren't really that secret. They just have kind of personas, I guess. They have to like. Yeah, I they mean, they all know each other. Just, right, I know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They, she knows who he is at this point. Yeah. He leaves, and Mars tells her, "Go after him." And the rest of the soldiers say, "Yeah, go for it." Sailor Venus says, "The tough experiences in life is what makes girls pretty." Mm-hmm. It's my favorite sailor. <laughs> We see Usagi running through the streets as we hear everybody wishing her luck, even the cats. She catches up with Mamoru looking at the moon. It's like 2.30 a.m. right now. I know, right? <laughs> Hopefully it's a Friday. Yeah, right. And she says, even if we're not supposed to be together in the future, right now, just for a little while. And while a noodly oboe rendition of Heart Moving plays, they embrace and share a kiss. Mm-hmm. This is it! Yes. This is youth! <laughs> I'm going to sacrifice my life in the future to get some. <laughs> no, it's more romantic than that. It but is. It's, it's very soapy. It's, it, it is. I in mean, the best way that this show is. I, and I mean, I get where Usagi's coming from, too. Like, like we don't know what the future is going to bring, and we don't know what this dream means. We don't need two brooders in this relationship. No. He can be the... You're, you're the mopey brooder. He can be the practical guy. She's yeah. gonna she's gonna feel her feelings. Yeah, Even exactly. if her responsibility is to protect the Earth and the timeline in the future. She's gonna do her best to do that, too. And Even if I die and the Earth is destroyed. Yeah. I was with you. Well, I mean, <laughs> how 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 romantic, even if it isn't necessarily the, the best way to go about things, you know, is she's going with her heart. That's and true. And she's, she's being genuine to herself. So um, I can appreciate that. The things that we're punishing at this point is mm. <laughs> just because every, because she kind of does it too. Everything that, yeah, the, the girls who want to eat fruit, delicious fruit, but find out it's evil, right. are mad. Right. Even the fruit is angry. Right. Even the rutabagas are angry. <laughs> Rutabaga sounds like the angriest vegetable, isn't it? It, it does. It sounds very, very you know? rude and How, and how petty is it going to get? Yeah, This right. coupon said young girls should get a third color free when they buy two. In the name of the moon, Ulta, I'll punish you. <laughs> it can be pretty petty. I mean, there's so many. There's only so much like tr- true evil they can fight. Yeah. And then it's just, you know. Killing ice cream robots. Capitalism. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's it. There you go. Comrade Moon. Oh, Just invented Comrade Moon. Oh, my God. Um, um, and one more thing. I know that we talked about the self-sufficiency of Japanese children, mm-hmm. but this is getting a little crazy. <laughs> I almost feel like I know that she has to be out doing things. I also know that she's named after something that only appears at night and infrequently during the day. A right. moon. Right. Right. So like the soup, the soup, nighttime is the superhero time. Uh huh. But how does she get away with like they they kind of had to get rid of the parents because why why do they know that she's not sneaking out? Oh, at the, night all the Usagi's time? parents. Yeah, uh, this is a big thing. Like Peter Parker always had to like, okay, Aunt May, Aunt May, sure, all right, I'll just be in here studying. Yeah, and then they he don't climbs out the window. They don't deal with that like at all. And we get the feeling with how Mamoru um is like, hey, do you have any idea how late it is? That it's late. It's late when she comes to it's, talk to her. It's too late to bang on your ex-boyfriend's door. Yes. The neighbors. And you're making a ruckus yes. and people like quiet. Think so. of the neighbors. Yeah. We like quiet. Yes, exactly. But these girls are out getting abducted by aliens and all and, kinds of stuff. And she brought Shibuyusa with her for some reason, <laughs> yeah, who was a was not, very young child. Not, not and had no effect on the story. No, we just had to see her um, get attacked by the, the right. promise. We room. had to know that that was happening. Yes. Although, maybe she could just 
Luna, we don't know how. We actually are watching uh, PGSM. Right. And <laughs> we still don't know how the cats can use a phone. But, right. Uh, but they do. They can. Yeah. <laughs> so she could, she'd be used to could be at home. And while she's in the background. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> like, Luna could be like, something's wrong. Well, like she did not have to come along. Or like Usagi has a watch too, right? Yeah. Like Ami could just be like to everybody. Well, oh, that's right. We, Ami sees everybody around right? her. Well, then maybe Ami could get get it too. I, I don't or know. Just not or does there. Usagi not have a watch? Is it just the senshi that have watches? Because they need to be able to communicate with her too. So why isn't she? I'm <laughs> Maybe so that's why she's late all the time. Maybe. I don't know. No, guys, seriously. Like, I just need an alarm, something, a reminder. Like, no, no, no. <laughs> Only we have the watches. We They're will. color-coded. <laughs> Later on. Why is she late again? <laughs> I know. <laughs> Backtracking is back for an all-new season. Hi, I'm Caliban. And I'm Gooey Fame. And we'd like to introduce you to Backtracking, the podcast that explores the real-world inspirations behind your favorite episodes of Star Trek. From historical events to classical literature to blockbuster films, we go where no pod has gone before to seek out the origins of classic Trek tales. Did you know, Gooey, that the TNG episode Too Short a Season was an allegory for the Iran-Contra affair? Yeah, only sweatier. Did you know that the Enterprise episode Regeneration was an homage to the John Carpenter film The Thing? Archer and T'Pol freezing to death over a bottle of whiskey would have been a controversial ending. As a dog lover, Archer would not like The Thing, I'm guessing. Oh my god, movie night is cancelled. Join us every other Thursday for a journey back to the beginnings of the Trek universe. Backtracking is available wherever you get your podcasts. No, Porthos! For Kiro, Kiro Miro, or Curiously Looking Around, where we talk about elements of Japanese culture within the episode, today I thought we would talk about handcrafts from Japan, um, and possibly part one. So maybe we could, this is something that we can oh, revisit. there's a lot of handcrafts well, from Japan. Well, I mean, it depends on like just things that you make with your hands, right? Sure, the, sure. That are, are crafts or arts. In this episode, Umino and Naru tell Usagi about Puramiso Ringu, or promise rings. Pro wrestling? <laughs> yeah, right. Um, Usagi is confused, and frankly, so am I, and no, Umino, I have no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> um, I looked up promise rings in Japan, and while there are actual rings that you can put on your fingers for promises, similar as to what we have in the West, promise rings do not appear to be the Japanese teens, what J Japanese teens call friendship bracelets, only on Sailor Moon. Anyways, a similar to, to the concept of friendship bracelets is the handcraft uh, misanga, Misaga is defined as a good luck charm made from knotting embroidery thread or a similar material. And in this episode, Umino tells us that if you make a wish while you make the promise ring, then when it breaks, it will come true. With Misaga, supposedly if you make a wish when you tie on the bracelet, uh, then when it falls off from where, the wish will come true. Uh, when the sentry arrive at the building where the friendship bracelet store is, we are informed that the building is called Misanga Mansion. Which seems to imply that the, the entire building is for the purposes of arts it and crafts. It does imply that. Or, it's or the, the arts and crafts skyscraper. Right. Or it's it's like this is where the friendship bracelets are. So I think Misanga is actually um, a more common term for friendship bracelet sure. in, in Japan. Okay. Yeah. But I mean – Maybe they were just saying, maybe it's it's on the 12th floor. Right. And they're saying, we're here, but it's like a metomony. It's like, you know, we're at the place, but it's just a sure. part that represents, or is that a synecdoche? I can never remember which I is I don't which. know. <laughs> maybe that's what it is. It's a different question. Yeah. Ami, no, not Ami. Um, Naru, Umino, one of those characters, has mm -hmm. the flyer. And yes. it doesn't mean anything, but I did point out that there's a lady with green hair on the flyer. Yeah. We, we've watched 70 plus episodes of this show. We know where all this is going. Mm -hmm. But in the timeline of what we see in the show, yes. she doesn't summon the droid until right. after that scene. Yeah. So is the droid off on its own setting the school up? Because everybody knows about the bracelets already. They must be out there. Or are we just seeing that scene in the Spaceballs room and it just happened before? And it doesn't really matter to the timeline of the show. I, I honestly, I don't know if, if like that happened before, like that scene or, happened before. Um, uh, Sh 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 Shiggy Boogie 
Oogie, 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 shachi. Ootering? Ootering. <laughs> There's a, a little a bit of ootering in all of us. <laughs> oh uh, ootering, uh, when she transforms, she does look different. She does look a little bit different. Yeah, she does. She's got weird earrings still, and uh-huh. her hair is kind of poofy. But yeah. So maybe there is a real teacher, but she has replaced the teacher at the school. I mean, that's possible. We. And she's like, we, come on, kids, make one actually... for everybody. Make ten for all your friends. Put them on. Actually, that's probably more likely because that's what the other droids did. Right, and we don't know if they looked like there's the people lot, they a, took a, out. A lot over. of variety in droid strategy. I know, but um, like in in Bob Floyd, they yeah, they tied up the Floyd. employees. There in were the back. real employees at yeah. some point, right? Yeah. So I don't know if but they... the perfume store mm-hmm. opened day one. It was just they owned the perfume store, but it was a, a cosmetic shop before they showed up, and then they took it over. So it wasn't like an empty storefront. And then it became a cosmetic shop. Wasn't it though? Because like, oh, because like um, Bertier like walks out of it. She's like, oh, this is going to be a great day for selling cosmetics. Uh I thought it was opening, like their grand opening. Well, it it would it is their grand opening, but I think it already was a cosmetic (laughs) store. (laughs) What do you what do you call a grand opening? I go okay, all right, okay, fine, all right. I I don't know. They weren't down at City Hall like pulling permits to like build this (laughs) this cosmetic store. Okay. There's a lot of, let's just say, we'll, we'll agree, there are a lot of scenes that we don't see. There are a ton we don't see. So I don't know if, like... Esmeralda's arguing with contractors. Right, right. <laughs> what do you mean it's going to cost me 60 grand? Yeah, right, exactly. Like, so I don't know if, like, the person with the green hair is supposed to be Esmeralda or if it's just a, you know... This is uh, an episode, for me, uh-huh. of a lot of headcanon. Yeah. And I'm going to say it is. All right. Uh, sounds Why not? Good. So then... So then within in, – in your theory is that it doesn't exist yet and then they come and they make it. Just to simplify it, let's say that it's the, – the, that her droid, Ootering, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Ootering uh, it has been out in the world doing things. Uh-huh. She isn't like creating the droid right there. She's uh-huh. just calling it to her, uh-huh. you know, to okay. say like, what's, what's up? Uh-huh. Because she sent it out before. Okay. I guess that even that, you have to kind of stretch for that. Yeah. What's the least stretchy way to explain it? Uh, that it happened before and it's not uh, the, the episode But if we don't see it on screen, it didn't happen, right? I, I don't know. If, if it doesn't happen continuity uh, or, or the, the store already exists uh, and they just took it over and she looks like the teacher that's there. Right, and the only thing that we have to assume that they don't show us is that there was a teacher. a teacher at some point. Yeah, we don't get that scene where she's closing a door and through the crack we see a naked teacher tied up with no with friendship no, bracelets. No, 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 <laughs> Sorry, we don't see promise that. Promise rings. Yeah, right. <laughs> she's just tied up with embroidery floss. Well, Umino and Naru have taken this class before, right? Right, so, but they but right, but they're also there that day. Yeah. So they could have been making completely innocuous friendship bracelets this whole time. But that, on that day, the yeah. special juice yeah. is in the strings. Right. The ones they make that day that That's they're wearing, true. nail them. Yeah. If we had had one thing where she's sprinkling pink glitter over the embroidery right. string. Mm-hmm. Well, I was just saying. We're doing important work here. We are. But I was just saying maybe they would recognize the teacher or be like, oh, hey, there's a new teacher or something like that. But well, we don't see a, that. It's a different lady. I don't know. How long is this class? She says, like, work on your homework. Like, they're going to come back and do this again. Yeah. But if you went to, like. A community center and just took a class on making friendship bracelets. That's it. Well, maybe that, it's a bucks, whole week. Gone. I don't know. <laughs> it's at symposium. Yeah, right. You <laughs> got to learn how to do different designs. We're, so, we're going to do the French braid next week. Well, right. Exactly. Um, so the etymology of Misanga seems to come from the Portuguese term. I'm hoping I'm saying this right. Uh, Misanga. It's M-I-C with a little uh, curvy thing underneath it. Uh, which means beads. Uh, Bees? Beads. Beads. <laughs> uh, and Misanga bracelets first became popular in 1993 during the beginning of the J1 League, which is the Japan Professional Football League. And when I say football, I mean what football. we yeah what we in the U.S. know as soccer. Ramos Roy and Tsuyoshi Kitazawa of the Tokyo Verde Football Club wore Misanga to wish good luck for their team. Misanga are supposed to not only represent friendship, but bring good luck as well. 
Uh, and when they fall off, then you go, oh, my God. Oh, no, you grab it's your not leg, supposed to hurt. <laughs> and you, you go, oh, it hit me. <laughs> it's not supposed Give to hurt. Give a red card. Um, so, <laughs> yeah, right. Football jokes. Um, so I went to summer camp, and I made many friendship bracelets with embroidery floss. I had a whole plastic case full of embroidery thread and spent many hours making friendship bracelets. Um, there were certain types of bracelets that I learned how to do really easily, and others, like Usagi, sometimes I started a bracelet and realized I didn't know what I was doing, and I stopped. Um, for the bracelets that I made and received, it was more that the bracelet represented the friend who made it and the friendship that you shared. Um, I definitely have also had wish bracelets, which tend to be made out of a thinner thread and have beads. And it is said that when the bracelet breaks, your wish comes true. Uh, I don't think I've ever made one. No? I've had one made for me. Oh, that's nice. Yes. Yeah. I had a whirlwind romance with, oh. a, with a girl one summer. And she was... Where, I'm actually surprised. I've worked in childcare myself and never made a million, a million crafts, never made one of these for me. But she was also working in childcare and made one. And she gave it to me. And I never took it off. Yeah. Until it like fell off. Right. In the shower like two months later. So did your wish come true? We broke up. Oh my God. Was that, <laughs> was that your wish? Maybe that was my wish. Yeah. <laughs> oh my God. So kumihimo is a traditional Japanese art form of, of making braids and cords. Kumihimo literally means gathered threads. And kumihimo are made by interlacing reels of yarn, commonly silk, with the use of traditional specialized looms. Either a uh, marudai, which literally means round stand, or a takadai, which means high stand. And takadai is also known, known as a uh, kodai. Um, there are a number of different styles of kumihimo weaving, which creates a braided cord ranging from very flat to almost entirely rounded. Kumihimo braids were first created by using finger loop braiding to weave different yarns together. A version of this is known as kute uchi kumihimo, um, emerged during 7th century Japan, or the Yamata period. During the Edo period, or 1603 to 1868, the marudai and the takadai looms were created, allowing more complicated braids to be constructed in a shorter amount of time. The marudai is generally made of a close-grained wood and consists of a round disc called a kagami, which means mirror, with a hole in the center, supported by four legs set in a base. Uh, the Japanese-style marudai is often about 16 inches or 40 centimeters high and is used while kneeling or when placed on a table. The Western style is typically 26 inches and uh, tall and allows the braider to sit in a chair to uh, make the braid. Uh, the threads that create the braid are wound around weighted bobbins called tama. Tama were once made of clay, but are now uh, most commonly made of wood filled with lead. The, <laughs> yeah, you to weigh pencils? them down. Uh, <laughs> no. uh, the weight of the tama maintains even tension of the, the warp threads and is balanced by a bag of counterweights called omori that is attached to the bottom of the braid. A traditional marudai did not have any markings indicating where the cords should be placed prior to starting and while creating the cord, so the artist did this by freehand. I, the, I, the, the people who can weave and, and do that stuff, mm -hmm. it just really impressed me. I'm embarrassed that I don't know how to do that. You know, the, the warp, the weft, the weave and all that. Yes. Um, when you think about it, a, a skill that we've been doing for long, thousands long of years, one of the most important skills yeah. in humanity's uh, history, and mm -hmm. I have no idea what I, if, if I, I ever know. if if fruit of the loom blows up tomorrow, like I'm screwed. You know, it's going to be wrapping leaves around myself. My my grandmother was a weaver, and she was a very mm. talented weaver. Um, and I am ninety nine percent sure that she actually had a marudai loom, and I didn't know what it was. You, well, she, is it the thing with uh, um, you can have like five or six different like spools of, of thread, least, you know? Yeah, yes. and they're all set up in the thing and they're going yeah. into the thing. Yeah, it's yeah. cool. Yeah, it, it's, it's really neat. Uh, so the braids created on the takadai, which is the the, the high stand, uh, tend to be flat, although 3D effects can be achieved, as opposed to the braids created in the marudai, which have a round or polygonal section. The huh. threads are, again, attached to tamas, so the, the weighted spools, uh, but they lay on uh, wood pieces with pegs that are called coma. Uh, a wooden sword, I mean, it's probably just a 
flat piece of wood that has a pointed yeah, end, yeah, yeah. Uh, is used to lightly beat the braid uh, once the braiding has been done. The braiding progress progresses in the shape of a V as opposed uh, to on a traditional loom where the weaving progresses in a straight line. Uh, the art that is worked on the takudai is a braid, not a weave, so technically it's a braid, although many of the patterns used on this braiding stand resemble the up and down motion of a weave, since each thread takes a turn being both the weft and the warp, right. it is a braid. So the weft is the, the crosswise threads on a loom over and under which the other threads or warp are passed to create the cloth. The present-day modern variation of kumihimo weaving discs exists, uh, typically made of a firm, dense foam with roughly 32 notches around the edge, creating the tension necessary for weaving kumihimo. Um, these discs are considered to be a much more affordable and portable alternative to a traditional uh, marudai, with many different sizes and shapes of discs available for purchase. However, a modern phone kumihimo disc is also considered less versatile than a traditional marudai as the weaver is constrained to using no more than 32 different threads, which is just crazy to me. <laughs> oh, only 32. Yeah, you can only use 32, <laughs> like that there's a possibility to use more, um, with, with their thickness uh, predetermined by the width of the notch. So the most prominent historical use of kumihimo was by samurai as uh, functional and decorative ways to lace their armor and their horse's armor. <laughs> so the cords that you see that connect um, samurai's armor together, yeah. that's kumihimo. Yeah. Um, which I think is really cool. And kumihimo cords were also traditionally made for Buddhist and Shinto altars, as well as household accessories. Uh, kumihimo cords are now used as ties on haori jackets, which are the traditional jackets that we talked about that are worn over kimono. Mm. So it's like the clasp there. Yeah, right. Um, and as obijime, or cords that are worn uh, belted around the front of the obi when wearing kimono. Uh, today, kumihimo is an art form that is practiced all over the world. Uh, it is sometimes used to make braided friendship bracelets. Um, <laughs> what are those? Yeah, I know, Don't right? you mean promise rings? I know. <laughs> um, and sometimes artists use different mediums, such as beads or wire, to do a kumihimo design. It is often used to make different kinds of jewelry or to add adornment to clothing or handbags. Uh, tamari are, is a folk art form uh, and Japanese craft that most likely originated in China and was introduced to Japan around the 7th century AD. Tamari means handball in Japanese. <laughs> Te means hand and mari means ball. It's pretty straightforward. Yeah, I was out at the Tamari courts the other day and I saw <laughs> Landon, my nemesis. Yeah, right. We went a few rounds. <laughs> With the handball. Um, Enjoyed a, a brisk martini. <laughs> it's a good day. Yes. It, it is thought that Tamari developed from Kmari, which is a non-competitive sport during the Heian period, and it is similar to present-day hacky sack, as the objective is to keep the ball in the air using any body part except your hands and arms. Huh. Uh, and the Kmari balls were made out of deer skin. So that's what the outside of the balls were made out of. Uh -huh. In uh, 1223, tamari were first mentioned in Japanese literature. Uh, tamari were, as the name suggests, used to play handball games. Frequently, these games were also accompanied by tamari uta, and uta means song, rhyming songs akin to jump rope rhymes. Historically, tamari were constructed from the remnants of old kimono, um, pieces of silk fabric would be wadded up to form a ball, and then the wad would be wrapped with thin strips of fabric. During the Edo period, traditional tamari became an art, uh, with the functional stitching becoming more decorative and detailed until the balls displayed intricate embroidery. With the introduction of rubber to Japan, the balls went from toys to art objects, although mothers still made them for their children. Tamari became an art and craft of the Japanese upper class and aristocracy, and, and noble women competed, competed in creating increasingly beautiful and intricate objects, which seems so Japanese. <laughs> uh, some even altered so as to double as handbags, so they would make a tamari that was mm, a handbag. Nice. Uh, it is during this time that there was a shift from using silk thread to a cotton thread to decorate tamari, making the craft more affordable and accessible to everybody. Today, embroidery thread is typically used to create the patterns. 
Tamari are highly valued and cherished gifts, symbolizing deep friendship and loyalty. Also, the brilliant colors and threads used are symbolic of wishing the recipient a brilliant and happy life. <laughs> Traditionally, becoming a craftsman in Japan was a tedious process. Becoming a Tamari artist in Japan to today requires specific training, and one must be tested on one's skills and technique before uh, being acknowledged as a crafter of Tamari. Ooh. Traditionally, Tamari are often given to children from their parents on New Year's Day. There is a lot of mention in my research of Tamari specifically being gifts from mothers to daughters. Uh, inside the tightly wrapped layers of each ball, the mother would have placed a small piece of paper with a goodwill wish for her child. The child would never be told what their wish from their mother had their wish their mother had made while making the ball. So it's kind of like a, a nice wish that you're you're just never gonna know what it is, but it's just <laughs> there, and, and the 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 ball wish reminds you. Shut you up. <laughs> <laughs> um, alternately, some balls contained. Noisemakers consisting of rice grains or bells to add to the play value. Uh, it is said that traditional tamari were wrapped so tightly they would bounce. Um, <laughs> Until <laughs> rubber put them out of business. Yeah. All tamari are, are made according to some specific method of construction that involves dividing the mari into a number of sections through the use of temporarily placed pins and permanently placed threads. Traditionally, tamari patterns were typically flower or animal motifs. Uh, one of the most common patterns that is still used today is the chrysanthemum pattern, which is, looks like a chrysanthemum flower. Sure. Um, today, tamari artists use traditional patterns as well as designing their own. Many create various geometric patterns. Uh, the core can be made from wrapped rice husks, then wrapped with cotton thread. Uh, this is referred to as a wrapped baseball. Don't get that confused with an actual... A base ball? <laughs> yeah, that, it's your base. Then ball head pins are placed to determine the top, bottom, and middle section of the tamari. Um, and then to guide where to place the pins, a strip of paper is used. Uh, and one wraps their guide thread around the pins. Uh, this makes the division sections... Um, and kind of helps create your pattern. Yeah. Um, and then all tamari are created by hand. Uh, I actually have a tamari that I bid on at a conference. Um, an artist made tamari designs that were inspired by Marvel characters. The one that I have was inspired by Spider Gwen. Um, so it has her colors and some silver thread that invokes the feeling of spider webs. It's really cool. Yeah. It's too bad we hacky sacked it to death. <laughs> No. <laughs> so those are just some things and they all are um thread related so there you go boy just pre-internet it was amazing what people could accomplish right <laughs> yeah now we just get all that research off the internet but no no tamaki making stuff for us i i know <laughs> so it, it is does seem to be somewhat of a dying art form um there are still some artists in japan that uh make tamari and and have classes and stuff like that but um not as many people are taking it up as used to to make it which is a little sad so what do they do with their time the internet i don't know <laughs> <laughs> video games uh, exactly what have you been a video game where you could i guess in, in a video game it would just be uh, 10 things of cloth and one strip of paper Right. right. Uh, it. Tamari. Tamari. There you go. All set. Uh, you can unlock different patterns or something. I don't know. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. yeah that you use a die that you got from collecting 10 right. flowers. Right. Yeah. Right. We're so, all set. I'm set for the apocalypse. There you go. Oh, my God. I have a whole bunch of embroidery thread. I'm good to go. Yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> Itadaki Masu with Usagi. What did Usagi eat in this episode? Not much, but after Usagi bumps into Umino at school and he tells her that the period is a study hall, she says, quote, I wish I'd had another bowl of rice. <laughs> yes. Implying, morning, morning rice. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Implying that she is still hungry and that if it's just study hall, who cares if she's late? You know? <laughs> Like, it doesn't matter. I saw a YouTube video that said, like, um, it was like the day in the life of a Japanese man or something like that. Uh -huh. A 30-year-old Japanese man. Oh, yeah. Did you Specific, watch it? No, I haven't watched it yet. Okay. Because I didn't want to be depressed. Because I'm assuming oh, boy. that this is not a 
you know, a 30 year old married salary man who's going to be rushing through his day and riding, getting pushed onto a train and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. It seemed like it was like a Hikikomori situation. So I'll watch it and I'll report back. Okay. But the thumbnail was a rice cooker and he's making rice. Mm -hmm. It looked like he was making a lot of rice. Mm -hmm. Do you like make rice for the day? Like at the beginning of the day? Yeah, you can do that. Okay. Yeah. Because I was thinking when she says, oh, I want another bowl of rice. I was thinking like, geez, how much rice do you want? But she doesn't remember. They're Japanese. We're Americans. Oh, yeah. I'm an American. <laughs> My bowl of rice would be a bucket of rice. She probably had like a little bit of rice In and rice some other bowl. stuff. Yeah. And then had to rush out. So like two bowls of rice. No big deal. Yeah. 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 It might be. They do a lot of running. I don't know why the cats extra. are always on them about like, getting fat because all they do is just they, run, they from, run around from energy rings and yeah. and ninjas that are throwing knives at them. And, right. Yeah. Running is their most common form of transportation. That's basically, yeah, that's their defense. That's the, how they, how they, get they around. transport themselves. Yeah. They go after their erstwhile boyfriends. Yeah. I mean, if they had something that like tr- literally transported them from one place to place, then, then maybe I'd be worried. But sailor teleport. There you go. They, well, start, they start abusing the sailor teleport. Oh my God. That would be so bad. They're like, we need more power because they're real big come on come on you guys we're out of, that's we're out so of power. sad <laughs> they would have to all use it though right because they have to be all together to use it right so they so would have all... to all be abusing the power yeah. of the sailor teleport they're all, yeah not fitting into their costumes together. right right that's that's really sad <laughs> okay, now we're doing the luna bit yeah yeah <laughs> let's let's get out of this uh, so, Villain Gage, we rate a baddie one to five dark stars, five being the most wicked. The droid in this episode is named Udaring, which is pronounced Udaringu in Japanese. Her name consists of the words Ude, which means arm, and Ringu, which means ring in Japanese. This refers to the bracelets she wears and those she helps others make the promise rings. Um, I don't know why... I guess Uda Ring Ringu sounds cooler than whatever. I'm not sure what the word for bracelet is in Japanese, but like I guess it sounds cooler in some way. Like it's yeah. it's an arm ring. Right. Like to me, it arm ring sounds strange. Yeah. Like an arm band, okay? Yeah. Or a brace or something. And she has like arm and she she wears the the bracelets herself. Yeah, she does. She's got them on her ankles and her, her wrists. Yes. Yeah, maybe there's some other automatopoeia or language thing that we're we're not getting. Yeah. Although Udering is a funny sounding name. It is funny. <laughs> Udering. So <laughs> when I was looking it up, there was a site that suggested it sounds like wedding ring. I don't mm. agree with that. Huh. I don't think that Udaringu sounds like we- wedding Udaringu. I don't think it really sounds like it. No. But, but maybe we, that's just me. Somehow we got... Pro wrestling, pro, yeah. re, pro, pro wrestling. Well, promise ringu sounds yeah. I, I guess I could kind of see that, but yeah, this is where they're like, mm, loan words, <laughs> stupid English, stupid English. I love it, yeah, right. Um, <sighs> well, she what is, a droid. yeah, she's what a, a talker, yeah, um, yeah. And if you're if you're going to teach classes, I guess you need to be able to say more than variations on your name, you know, her human form, it's fine. Yeah. No problem. Right. Let's talk. Let's talk about the droid form. Yeah. Um, should we talk we s- about her design? Well, here? this is something that we seem to run into a lot, and maybe we need to just like tackle the issue itself, mm. and then not ever bring it up again, unless we have to. But you know, maybe from time to time. But that's it's the idea of you know wearing clothes and stuff from a culture that's other not cultures. Your yeah. And if you set aside, you know, in the in the world of this universe, these are robots, right? Yes. <laughs> they, they are just robots. Yes. If you set aside that they're robots, you know, if they were actually ethnic people, we don't mm-hmm. got a problem. Mm-hmm. You know, but how do you combine that? If she summons like Chief Robo Joseph and he's a robot constructed to look like a Native American. Yeah. Uh, I, he's not a person. Is that okay? Right. I don't know. That's the reality of this show. Yes. Westworld does it every day. All they do is just build people who are Native Americans, yeah, right? Yeah, I know. The problem is, is that in this show, the droid is just pen and ink made by real humans in Japan yeah. who have little to no familiarity with the cultures that they are copying or, as we say now, appropriating. Yeah. So is it accurate? Are they being respectful? Mm. What are they trying to say? Yeah. We don't know. They probably don't know. I'm not sure they They're know. just overworked animators. Yeah. We talk about fashion on this show from time to time. 
It's kind of like when a fashion designer says, oh, I'm going to make a, I'm going to make a squaw dress. We'll put a big feathery headdress on the model. Bad idea. Like we know that's not cool. Yeah. But it still happens. It does still happen. If, if you say, put a nun's coif, their hat uh-huh. on a model and it goes with her black bikini with crosses on it and a big rosary, oh white goodness. people would lose their minds no, and say that right. that's disrespectful. Yeah. But it's the same thing for the Native American yeah, stuff or any sure. culture's revered clothing. Mm-hmm. There's an argument, I think, that if you're making art or you're making a statement, then you can do what you want and you have to expect that some people aren't going to like it. Sure. Like with the nun thing. Mm-hmm. But when it comes to minorities and marginalized people and what they hold sacred... I think you really need to think twice before you start doing whatever you want. I do too. There's an artist locally where we live mm. who fancies himself something of a folk artist for mm-hmm. the people in our area. He's a white guy. We live in a fairly diverse area. And a while ago, he put on a show of quote unquote native art where he did a bunch of, a bunch of paintings and drawings in a Native American style As telling a white Native person. American stories. Yeah. yeah. Here, it was in the style. Here are the quotes. And people yeah. got mad. A lot of Native groups were like, hey, these aren't your stories to tell. Right. They mean more to us. There's Native artists that are telling these stories, and you're yeah. just trying to horn in on this. Mm-hmm. Your take isn't as important as the people who have lived these stories. Right. Then there's Scaffold. Oh, God. Don't even get me started on that. Scaffold. Uh, scaffold, um, Walker Art Center, Sculpture Garden. Just yeah. search for that. Maybe you'll find the article that I wrote about it. Who knows? But search for that if you want a little controversy. So. Uh... My point is, is that we don't have to make a big deal out of it, out of it every time. Yeah. You know, what's done is done. The show is almost 30 years old. Mm -hmm. But I think it would be all for nothing if we didn't learn the lesson of sensitivity that we Mm -hmm. can get from this show's missteps. Mm -hmm. Right. I I would agree with that. That being said, I got no idea what she's dressed as, but I know I don't like it. (laughs) Is it Egyptian? I think it's Egyptian or Egyptian inspired. Can I, can I throw something out there? You can try. I think it's a mixture of different cultures. I I think you're probably right. And and so, but uh, but mostly Egyptian. Th- this is okay. I I see the Egyptian or or possibly Greek that part of the world. The, right. The the, 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 the drapery the of flax, the flax. Yeah. The, the, skirt. the pleated like flax skirt mm-hmm. and the shoes make yeah. me think Egyptian. But the shoes are like pointed up, which also reminds me of a lot of clothing that's well, found a, in the Middle East. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, so, the Egypt is what the Near East. I, I, I know. It's the same. <laughs> So I'm seeing just a mixture of different cultures that are yeah. all within the same sort of yeah. area. The the the, the crisscross applesauce uh, He-Man vest yeah. doesn't exist for any women in ancient Egypt, Egyptian with uh, the the clothing. armor, um, uh, the shoulder armor that the flexes out. Yes, that's kind of the closest thing I can think of. Mm-hmm. And actually, um, I'm going to show you something that, of course, the uh, audience will never will never see themselves. But right. This is a Modern, this is like a D&D art. Oh, of, I see. You know, a, a female Egyptian warrior. Yeah. And it's got, what what gets me is she's got, our girl, uh, Uttering, has both the um, necklace, yes. the crescent necklace, but mm-hmm. she's also got the shoulders that go out too. Like they tried to combine. Right. Like if we, if a, if a female wore like a, you know, tunic uh, type arm, chest pieced armor mm-hmm. with pointed shoulders. That's mm-hmm. why I think the pointed shoulders are supposed to be. Like what we think of as Egyptian, but I in reality, that. most women didn't wear shirts right. if they weren't yeah, royalty well, right. uh, in in, in uh, ancient Egypt. And I think the gold color it kind of comes off as it's like metal. Yeah. So here, here oh, and the and her she wears her jewel. Yes. Kind of like like a scarab would be. Yeah. Right, and it's like this thick like choker chain. But then she's her got neck. face paint and uh, the, the, and the face paint like the star I can't help but think of Bowie but then like <laughs> or gem or gem this droid is truly outrageous right and then there's like two lines on her chin and then like one line again on her other eye and that just makes me think of Native American yeah. face paint so I'm just really not it's sure it's almost like once again the show is always ahead of us even when it's trying to piss us off mm-hmm. because last week we you know tried to put our foot down mm-hmm. and the show comes back like oh do you like this oh and then she says <laughs> well, all they're missing here is uh irish and uh a big hood for an eskimo right inuit and, and she me. says olay yeah she says which is olay. spanish yeah i don't know so this episode aired in japan in 1993 and she does the when she does the five ring behind her it looks like the olympic insignia it does doesn't it so the olympics were in barcelona spain in 1992 barcelona barcelona so i think that maybe 
They're like, oh, she's a mixture of all different cultures coming together, like the Olympics. Everybody can hate this. Right. That is, that's just me out on a limb thinking that maybe that's what this is. Otherwise, I, guess, I, I can't pinpoint one exactly. Then she have a baseball cap. <laughs> and yeah. uh, 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 on top of a, a Russian fur hat, you know. I know. I know. <laughs> or maybe um, a Russian fur hat with a bill and a snapback. Oh, there you go. Like a baseball cap. Yeah, right. If you're going to... Don't don't leave us questioning. If you're going to do a thing, make sure we know the thing was done. I, I, I know, right? Um, and I looked up her design document, and I thought maybe there'd be some notes. Some notes? There aren't. No. It, there aren't, really. That doesn't really surprise me. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I think you're right. Like everybody will be unhappy. Yeah. And then nobody's happy about yeah, this. Yeah. And then she has like a bunch of gold jewelry. She's got gold hoops and then like gold bracelets and gold anklets. So yeah. I, I don't know. Um the skirt looks cool, but I feel like I should be angry about it. And like <laughs> Well look. So she's got like purple hair with bangs. Oh, and she also she has a headband. Is that Native American? She sweats a lot. What what is this? Probably. Um, and uh, so she has a slightly darker complexion. Yep. So I don't really know what to make of that. Like again, you are saying these are droids, and it doesn't seem like. Well, plus this if, is like, a particular culture that we're exploiting. Right, and if but, like, if if uh, um, Matoki's girlfriend uh, had some some friends in mm -hmm. Africa mm -hmm. that were on screen and they were darker skin. Fine. Right. But it's like not only are did the people who made this show make these characters. Yes. But also like presumably a factory in the future made them too. Right. And I don't – if I saw dark faces within the Black Moon clan, mm -hmm. I would have no problem with it. Right. But instead, like we said last week, every character has a theme. And when the theme is a banana, it's yeah. like, okay. I have a problem with yeah. that. And I do kind of have a problem with this because I feel like I should be upset about it. Otherwise, it's like, great, let's get some more diversity in right. this show with just a bunch of pale Japanese girls to turn right. into superheroes. Exactly. But let's... when they're like, oh, I'm the banana person, it's like, oh, boy, oh, boy. I know. I know. Let's get more <laughs> diversity than the different color Day hair color. no. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> so I guess we're up to our rating. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think that she kind of keeps our girls on their toes, and I like... Well, oh, oh, we were going to talk about the ethnic pattern of. I don't. Even, how, why do you even like? Well, it's that's the ethnic pattern is just like that's the sealed with a kiss because it's the whole show is often showing a sort of a, a leaden sense of like what is uh, okay or not. Yeah, I mean, and in, to be fair, in the nineties, it, it nobody cared. It was right. okay. Um, but the fact that like there's just like oh there's you know there's ethnic patterns. Mm -hmm. It's like okay, well it just shows like that you don't see that this is a, a sensitive topic or right. at least it, it you can't just the, the fact that you just there's an umbrella term for ethnic right what does that mean right I, i'm not entirely sure what that means i think it means it would mean black in the, in america but maybe it means i knew in japan it i don't might. know yeah it might I, I mean i friendship bracelets you, you go back to a lot of different cultures but one of the cult <laughs> well like you can trace them back to a lot of different cultures is what i meant and like there's variations and you know within native american cultures and yeah. in places in south america yeah, achilles and patroclus were had him and that's what he had his on his ankle and when he got right. hit that's that was it right right exactly <laughs> Bad luck, I guess he. His, they go back a ways. Yeah, his you know, wish in the garden, come true. Adam and Eve were like, "Oh, well, well, let's, let's, have, let's have an ethnic pattern on this." Oh my goodness, we're not wearing clothes, but let's make bracelets. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Okay, give me a um, rating. So, I mean, like she kind of keeps them on their toes, and I like that she is still giving out patterns uh, for the most part, except for the ethnic pattern thing. Um, and that like there are different ones for different things. I think that's really clever. I think um, she says a lot of interesting things, um, you know, like impudent little brat. This is what happens to anyone who gets in our way. Uh, and uh, ring. yeah, and Ringu. Um, but, you know, I, I find her design overall troubling. Um, and I, I just puts a bad taste in my mouth. So I'm going to give her three out of five dark stars. Oh, this is um, it's bad taste. Three, three. All right. Average. Out middle of the road. Um, three uh -huh. for me. Yeah. Solely for the teacher parts. I think the it's fascinating that 
Sure, sure. Maybe, and they don't even have to, it's been established that they don't have to be like complete or done well. I think the strings just have the dark power in them. A lot of headcanon in this episode mm-hmm. because we established that Usagi has not finished this thing. Right. And yet Chibi's like, oh, that's for me. And she clearly just puts it on. Yeah. And then still gets shocked. Mm-hmm. So it's not like the kids have to do it well. Yes. But she's in there in this class for some reason trying to get them to do it well. And yes. I don't know if it's like just an evil point of pride. Oh, that's a good point. Or if they're more effective. Maybe if it had been uh, competently weaved, sorry, Usagi, uh-huh. woven, uh, it would have been unremovable by a cat. Maybe. So I don't know. Who knows? But the fact, the very fact that it gave me uh, endless minutes of uh, <laughs> of head cannoning. And uh, just trying to think about different aspects of it is is good enough to raise it from the two it probably should have been okay. to a three. All right. And I'll we, give it a three. We have no uh, Sakura Sensei or um, Haruna Sensei. Her, her first name is something with Sakura. Um, Haruna Sensei in this episode. So we have a different Sensei who happens to be Uttering. But I know. Yeah. I would have liked some Haruna Sensei as well. well. But anyways... That uh, dish is off the menu. Yeah, right. Exactly. For our segment, Sabu or Dabu, where we talk about the most interesting differences between the sub and the dub. In the dub, the droid Uta Ring is renamed Regalia, most likely due to the fact that her rings at one point like look like the Olympic rings. That's just me headcanoning Another it. Another huge stretch. Yeah, I know. Um, in the dub, Us- the scene at the very beginning where Usagi bumps into Umino and the following conversation with Umino and Naru is cut. Mm-hmm. My guess is they didn't know how to uh, change the get out of the her saying that it was kinky or something like that. Yeah, uh, is my guess. Um, in the dub, the a- well, it's just like which is just like that's whatever. weird. Yeah, They're right. Like, oh, it's not that weird. Right. Burr, burr, Done. Burr, burr. Yeah. yeah. Um, in the dub, a clip of Esmeralda floating in the air was cut. I'm not sure. If, my guess is it's the, the first time we see her floating in the air where she summons Uttering. I, I, I don't know. Huh. Somebody just flying in the air. They thought maybe kids would. I don't know why oh, they well, cut Oh, well, she's it. sort of like, you know, hugging herself. She's kind of having a moment. She's I guess. Like, oh, Prince Amanda. Yeah, maybe that's why it was cut. I don't know. <laughs> right. As the people below her are like, what? I know. <laughs> Uh, and then I, one little bit of trivia, right after the episode title card, while U- Umino is explaining the promise rings to Usagi, he had six fingers on his left hand. So just a little <laughs> um, uh, mistake Hello. there. Yeah. <laughs> My name is Indigo Montoya. <laughs> uh, and now we are up to our rating. I love how supportive Mako and Ami are about Usagi making a promise ring. And I actually got the feeling that like they were almost like her parents dropping her off at a class. Like, here you go, honey. <laughs> yeah. This is all you need. We'll okay. be right outside. I'll be smoking in the car. Right. <laughs> um, I love that Mako says that the power of a belief can cheer you up. There's a lot of truth in that. And it, I think it's super sweet. I love that Naru and Umino play a prominent role in this episode as well. And, you know, we haven't seen them as much lately, so I'm glad that we we see them in this. Um, And just how supportive everyone is at the end in encouraging Usagi to go after Mamoru, it just really gets to me. Plus, I'm just really happy that they are back together. So I'm going to give this episode uh, four out of five roses. (sighs) That's respectable. It's a good rating. Mm. It should probably be mine. (laughs) But screw it, I'm going with a five. Oh, okay. This episode has flaws. Yes. Which we have talked about. Yes. But I something about the old school fun of, hey, did you hear about the new shop <laughs> in Juban District? I know. <laughs> People getting some item. All the kids are crazy for friendship break. I'm oh, sorry, promise rings. I know. All of a sudden, and of course they're dangerous. Because of this horrible dystopia yes. they all live in. Yes. But I don't know. Something about it. Seeing Naru and Amina again. Yeah. Uh, minus Saharuna Sensei. But still just brought back the good feelings of the original Sailor Moon series. And uh, yeah. I got to forgive its faults. Okay. But this is like the lowest five I've ever. It's like five plus. <laughs> four plus. Four plus? Yeah. Four plus. This is like four four point nine 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 nine. Okay. Okay. Uh, infinite repeating. Okay. Integer. All right. But yeah, let's say five. Okay. 
It's a bit of fun. It, it is a bit of fun. And I agree. A, a motion. There's a motion. There's a lot of emotion. My emotions. <laughs> uh, and my English title is Usagi and Mamoru's Joy, Mended Hearts. Nice. Mm-hmm. Nice. Yeah. That could be the, the title. That's what I was going for. Yeah. Yeah. You nailed it. Uh, well, how about you? My deek title is With This Ring, I The Dead. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> Next episode, we are talking about episode number 78. Venusu Minako no Naso Daisodo in Japanese. Venus Minako's Nurse Mayhem, the English translation, and the English title, No Thanks, Nurse Venus. <laughs> Goodbye, Nurse. <laughs> well, a yes. Venus episode. Yes. We'll have to hear about Alan. Yeah. Oh, boy. <laughs> Hopefully not. Hopefully not. Hopefully we can uh, get the nurse to cut freeze that off oh like, a, like a wart. <laughs> get rid of that. Get rid of that uh, love sickness. Yeah. We don't need it. All these girls uh, are in love with, uh, well, not all of them, but there's a, a frightening high number that are in love with uh, men that are older than they are. Yeah. And who are unattainable in some way. Yeah. 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 yeah it's not great. Uh, we, we've had a couple episodes about it. We're... I mean, Minako Aminos, and... now that Amino is unavailable, <laughs> maybe like uh, Mako's, Mako's like, oh, it reminds me of my sensei's oh weird my spiral eyes. That's weird. <laughs> Let's hope not. Oh, um, he wears uh, shrimp on his hands like my old oh <laughs> senpai. God. No. <laughs> Can I say I like that Naru is going for somebody who is like her own age and like a genuinely nice person. So, I mean, nothing against Snefrite, but, you know. Yeah. Uh, but they don't have Sundays. No, they don't. They don't. That's too much for her. Yeah. Right. He's like, let's go have a Sunday. She's like, I can't. I can't dare to parfait ever again. I can't again. have a Sunday on Friday I know. or whatever it was. <laughs> Well, that's our show for this week, and the name of the moon will be punishing you next week with another episode of Sailor Noob. Peace! <laughs>